Um, so just to uh, reiterate some of what um, Rosa just said, thank you so much for being here so early in the morning after such a late night. Um, and thank you so much to the Sonic X team. Uh, you guys have been amazing and so well organized. And this has just been such a pleasure and an honor uh, to get to speak with everybody. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, so my talk is called The Queer Futurity of Plastic. And this comes out of my ongoing research around uh, plastic. And um, actually, maybe I'll go back, sorry. Um, and the reason why I became really fascinating and, and interested in plastic is because, for me, it feels like it's the intimacy of oil. Um, so, you know, we think about our relationship to oil as primarily, and especially as a substance, as primarily through electricity grids or through gasoline or through other kinds of um, ways in which uh, we interact with oil. And obviously we understand that our economies and our wars and the ways in which um, uh, politics is oriented is, is completely dominated by this uh, particular primordial substance. Um, but one of the things that I... Um, was really interested in was the way in which plastic becomes such an intimate part of our everyday lives. So everything from our clothes to uh, sex toys to uh, baby bottles, etc. cetera. Um, so I wanna start with just a little story um, because I found this and I thought it was so strange. Um, Bruce Mowry, one of the amazing things about doing work on plastic is that there's so many strange weird stories, which uh, some of which I will hope to present today. Um, so Bruce Mowry is a city engineer for Miami Beach, and what you're seeing here is the kind of constant flooding that Miami Beach undergoes, and this is happening more and more frequently, obviously, as sea levels rise, but also as the acidification of the oceans happen, because Miami is situated on a limestone um, bedrock, and as the ocean rises, the, the ocean doesn't just rise from the outside, it's literally sort of coming up underneath the rock, and so it's saturating everything, and so periodically you get these like massive amounts of flooding, and they have all kinds of crazy pumping systems in order to be able to control this, um, but Bruce, Bruce Mowry, who's um, one of the city engineers, um, he said, he said that, that, that actually he wanted to find some kind of resin to fill in the holes in the limestone to be able to make it impermeable. And I think that this, uh, this kind of desire uh, to completely um, coat the world in plastic um, is the place at which I would like to start. So, um, well, what is plastic? Obviously, plastic is um, a material that... Uh, is fairly ubiquitous. Um, it was actually uh, originally formed in um, the early 1900s. The first type of plastic, which is actually a synthetic polymer, um, was made by uh, Bakeland. And, and since then, obviously, the rise of plastic has been fairly ubiquitous. It obviously, it's a particle that, um, or it's a series of, of molecules um, that are characterized by their polymeric structure. So it's not actually a uniform material, but what is uniform about it is the fact that it holds on to its identity under virtually all conditions. Um, and that is another one of the ways in which I think it's sort of a totally fascinating object. So... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about plastic and its geology. So this is a new kind of rock uh, that Kelly Jazvac um, and uh, Patricia Corkin and um, Captain uh, Moore all uh, coined a new term for. And this is, these are called the plastiglomerate stones. Um, and they were officially sort of recognized in 2013 by the Geological Society of America. And they are recognized as a new type of rock. Um, and obviously what is interesting about these rocks is that they really are the, um, the I mean, they're a plastic rock. So what actually happened is that they went to these beaches in Hawaii and on there's so much plastic just sort of embedded in the sand there that people would go and have bonfires. And as the bonfires would be roaring, the plastic that's, that's just there is kind of 
that permeates the entire environment um, would melt. And as it would melt, it would adhere to all kinds of other uh, substances. So what, what the plastiglomerate is, is a hybrid material resulting from the fusion of plastic debris with natural materials such as lava, wood, metal, sand, and marine corals. Um, and so what I find fascinating about this is that plastic um, is one of the proposed indicators of the Anthropocene, and regardless how you feel about the Anthropocene, um, I think that the, the plastic really is, it is one of those, one of those um, materials that there's a very clean dividing line between before and after it gets introduced. And we don't really have a very good sense of the longevity of plastic, but certainly in certain kinds of conditions, such as the bottom of the ocean um, or in the geologic layer, uh, you know, our best estimates is that it will um, stick around for about 100,000 years. Although I'll come back to that. Uh, timeline in just a little bit. But one of the things that I find fascinating about what does it mean for plastic to become a new type of rock, either, you know, the bedrock of a new Miami that will maybe, you know, break off and start floating around the ocean as some sort of strange Miami, Miami beach, or as this kind of literally um, becoming rock of plastic, is that it, it, um, it really defies the rest of the logic of the earth, or the rest of the logic of what rock actually means. So there is a fundamental difference between rock, rock that is the foundation of the earth, and plastic. When we point out the synthetic or artificial nature of something, what we are pointing to is the way in which it develops, emerges, or is created irrespective of its surrounding environment. Plastic is the ultimate universality because it has no relationship to any kind of particular locale, and it's designed specifically to be able to be reproduced and rec replicable under almost any conditions. And this actually poses a problem um, when you're trying to do things like dating plastic objects because their molecular structure is designed to be uh, quite similar, and also because of the fact that once it adheres within, within a, a particular kind of form, it really is a fairly impenetrable object that is exactly the same all the way through. So its surface, is the same all the way through. Um, and this kind of universality is precisely the, the kind of problem with plastic. Um, so plastic is not of this earth in the sense that the earth itself, particular sites, carry memories of the creatures and activities that have taken place on them. There is an infolding of geology, atmosphere, and organism, one that mutually co-evolves and that carries with it certain memories and patterns of behavior, holding not only the memories of the human creatures that occupy or pass through a particular place, but also the memories of the other animals, plants, and geologies that, ultimately, that mutually inform that place. There is an infolding of knowledge through the circulation of matter and energy that passes through a place. A world develops with a particular organism and the organism with the world. They mutually compose and become co-constitutive of each other. And this is the kind of radical reciprocity from which, from which an ethics of land emerge, emerges, as indigenous scholars uh, Jeanette, Armstrong, Jeanette Armstrong argues, or in a similar vein, what... Um, another indigenous scholar from North America, Dwayne Donald, calls an ethical relationality. And plastic defies this entire logic. So as the rapid proliferation of materials that have no relation to any particular place defies the logic of the earth itself, and these re reciprocal and relational ethics that we are called upon to listen to. So even in geology, rocks bear traces or an inscription of their history, determining and being determined by the activities of the creatures that reside, pass through, live, and die within particular environments. The sense of ecology tied, tied to a notion of placemaking is defied by a material such as plastic. There is no local for plastic. Instead, plastic exists everywhere and anywhere. And um, and one of the things that I find particularly fascinating about the molecular structure of, of plastic is that it's designed to be so uh, self-contained. And in fact, um, one, of the, one of the arguments that I, that I make sometimes elsewhere is really that, um, that plastic wants to hold on to its identity uh, sort of against all, um, all outside influence. And, in, and thus can be really seen as the kind of uh, materialization of a Cartesian logic that um, otherwise in philosophy we've begun to decompose. So plastic hydrology. Um, so as most of you probably know, um, when 
plastic is dispersed throughout the world, often it ends up in the water, mainly just because the earth is uh, made of so much water. Um, but these are the places where um, it has gained the most attention, particularly in, the, in all of the gyres, where you know, there's this I idea of a floating um, mass of plastic, which isn't exactly true, but there's a huge amount of plastic in the oceans, and in some places uh, there's six times more plankton than plastic, and then there was that recent study that came out saying that there would be more plastic in the ocean uh, than fish by 2050, and that I mean, it depends exactly how you're measuring it, but basically what it's trying to call attention to is the fact that there's a huge amount of plastic in the oceans. Um, and this happens in all kinds of different ways. Um, it happens just because uh, uh, some places don't have proper waste streams to be able to um, deal with plastic. It happens obviously because of the rapid proliferation and production of plastic all throughout the globe. Um, it happens uh, by way of microbeads, which have thankfully been banned in Europe and in, now in parts of North America and elsewhere. Um, and it also happens through our clothing. So every time you put your pair of skinny jeans in the wash, uh, thousands of microfibers go directly into their water stream, and none of that is filtered out. Um, so that just ends up in the oceans. And you know those kinds of tiny pieces of plastic, uh, I would argue, are potentially much more um, challenging and from an ecological point of view because of the fact that they, can, uh, they are ingested um, by organisms such as coral uh, or bacteria or other, other kinds of organisms and are really pushing evolutionary change in a particular way, which I will get, get to in, in a few minutes. Um, so one of the things that, uh, sorry for the quality of the image, but it's, it's kind of an amazing image and, uh, and this, uh, this, I mean this, this river has the notorious or infamous um, moniker of being the most polluted river in the world, uh, although there has been an incredible amount of work being done to be able to clean it up. Um, but one of the reasons why I show this image is because clearly, obviously, um, plastic, just as petrocapitalism more generally, exacerbates the differences and um, differences in power and differences in terms of um, livability or who is left to die. Um, in, that already exists in our world. So clearly, you know, um, something like this might be happening in Indonesia, but in the privilege of Europe or North America, you know, we have we have the the ability to to pretend that when we consume and then throw out all of this plastic that is produced mainly for our, for our consumption, um, that it just you know suddenly vanishes. And then clearly, in in places like this, this is what you see. And one of the crazy things about this river is that there's actually so much um, plastic in certain parts of it, that the, um, that the water column has become anoxic, meaning that there's no oxygen in it, and therefore fish just die, or, and other creatures just die, because um, they can't live. Uh, so I just wanted to draw attention to that because of the fact that um, it's uh, clearly such a a kind of important thing. So this this photo um, is rather blurry, but it's it's such an amazing photo that I can't not um, show it. So um, this is another one of the stories about plastic that that I think are really incredible and point to um, something. Uh, well, point to the sort of conditions of our current world. So on April 11th, 2014, the Norwegian newspaper, The Local, reported that Bjorn Freeland caught a large cod that he discovered as he was getting it had swallowed a dildo. So this is him with the dildo and the cod. Um, and Freeland speculated that the fish mistook the dildo for one of the multicolored octopi that are its usual food source and are common to the area. So um, this certainly isn't the first time that, uh, yeah, you can totally laugh. <laughs> I mean, it's really funny. Um, and I love the fact that he seems just like so happy about this, like that the expression on his face is totally priceless. Um, <laughs> but um, but I try to draw attention to this for a number of different reasons. One is, obviously, this isn't the first case of um, uh, creatures ingesting plastic. Uh, there's you know everything from camel to whales to plankton to um, 
to corals, as I said before, all have mistaken plastic as a food source and have begun to ingest it. And we also uh, consume uh, plastic in part through salt that gets distilled from the oceans and tiny pieces of microplastics are found in that salt and then you know, when you consume it, then, then it's going into your gut as well. So this is a literally be literal becoming plastic of sort of all uh, biology. Um, but the thing that also really caught my attention in this relationship was the sort of um, the the relationship that that non non reproductive sex and queerness how that's inter intersecting with uh, with um, something a material like plastic. Um, so one of the ways in which this happens, one of the kind of arguments that I want to draw out in relationship to um, what does it mean to think about queer futurity in relationship to plastic, well, this happens in a number of different ways. I mean, one is a the sort of literal um, embodiment of uh, sex toys and the non-reproductive non sex as, um, as increasingly made of plastic structures. But more than that um, are the ways in which the, the um, chemical components of plasticizers um, most infamously uh, BPA are uh, interfering with our with our ability with uh, with inf with uh, our fertile like our ability to be able to reproduce so various plasticizers BPA uh, being the most famous of them um, but all the entire category of plasticizers called phthalates um, are all uh, correlated with infertility, recurrent miscarriages, feminization of male fem fetuses, early onset puberty, obesity, diabetes, reduced brain development, cancer, and neurological disorders such as early onset senility in adults and re reduced brain development in children. So um, clearly this is like a huge range of incredibly sort of toxic things that happen to the organism when you're um, being introduced to something like an endocrine disruptor um, and the reason why it, it affects so many or parts of the body is that hormonal systems obviously are so incredibly important to the functioning of any kind of living organism. Um, but one of the things that, um, that I find fascinating about this, and um, there's obviously a sort of very interesting ways in which to uh, begin to think about this is the fact that there's this, there's this correlation between non-reproductivity and, and the increasing prevalence of these kinds of chemicals in our environments. And at this moment where we are living through the sixth mass extinction event, this is happening for all kinds of reasons, mainly due to um, a loss of habitat and other kinds of um, things. But, but one of the other things that's happening in relationship to this is the fact that we are putting in all these chemicals into our environment and we have no idea what they do, but they certainly do change the relationship of, uh, of um, reproductive uh, organisms and specifically um, sexual, sexual reproduction. So what might this have to do with plastic futurity and specifically queer plastic futurity? Well, one of the pushbacks from queer theory is, um, and I, I'll, I'll read you this quote, is the supremacy bestowed to sexual difference is its ontological force is placed out, uh, is outpaced not only by social or political movements, but also by the metabolizing pollutants, xenotransplanting toxicants, and intravenous banes. Basically, the, the fact of sexual difference and the fact of our understanding of sexual difference is being challenged not only by gender and queer theory, but actually by the organisms that we are surrounding ourselves with. And the increasing amount of toxicity and chemicals that we are putting into the environment is um, it causing the evolution of organisms along these lines at a much more rapid pace than, um, than they would be otherwise. And I think that there's something um, quite beautiful and really interesting and generative in this movement um, because I think that one of the things that, that we really need to think through is perhaps what is an ethics, what does it mean to live in a world where there's such an incredible amount of extinction? And not just from the point of view of biology, but from the point of view of subjectivities from the point of view of, um, of entire communities and cultures. And so one of the ways in which to begin to think about this is to think about the kinds, the fact that, that 
many communities and specifically um, queer communities and other and um, other marginalized communities never really had any faith in the ability of social or sexual reproduction to begin with right there was the idea of futurity the idea of hope the idea of community building the idea of kinship was never built upon biological sexual reproduction in the first place and so I think that if we look towards those communities for an idea of what we're headed towards, we actually might find incredibly um, valuable and interesting and ethical systems by which to be able to face something like the increase, the decreased fertility of a species or the increased amount of extinction that we are, that we are processing. In other words, how do we rethink futurity along the lines um, that both coincides with what Lee Edelman has called no future um, in terms of queer theory, which is basically the dissolution of the social structure. He wants to um, have have a total break with um, social reproduction, so the reproduction of the social order, the symbolic order as we know it. How do we hold on to that piece of queer theory while also acknowledging the actual suffering that is um, taking place and the real losses that we are that we are faced faced with? And I think think thinking through these questions of kinship beyond reproduction, kinship beyond the human, um, and and thinking through uh, a notion of futurity or a no notion of ethics that does not rely upon any notion of reproduction, um, I think is incredibly helpful at this particular moment in time. And one of the reasons um, is because of uh, things like this. So this is, um, this is of the plastosphere. These are the organisms that live on the plastosphere. And the plastosphere is a, is a new community of microbes that um, exist on the tiny pieces of plastic that float around in the ocean. Um, and no one's really sure whether the microbes just like to live on the plastic or whether they're actually um, consuming the plastic and if they are consuming the plastic, whether they can digest it. Um, those are all different kinds of questions. And when I said earlier, oh, sorry, I'll just that our best guess for the longevity of plastic is 100,000 years, what that actually means is how long will it take for an organism to, um, to evolve to be able to digest plastic, right? So that's what it means when plastic uh, is going to be around for 100,000 years. Our best guess is that that's how long it's going to take, but actually um, there's some new evidence that there are organisms that currently can, di uh, can digest plastic, so um, certain forms of bacteria. So, so perhaps this is happening at a much, rapid, much more rapid rate than we, um, than we originally anticipated. Um, but I think that... Um, um, that, that clearly this also will, will be affected by what type of plastic it is, where it is, and all these other kinds of factors. So the longevity of plastic is still definitively a problem. And you know, um, there's a fantastic uh, book called um, Mutant 94 uh, that um, talks about what would happen if um, a, a plastic eating organism was released into the world. And it's an amazing kind of imaginative exercise because if you think about it, um, you know, our computers would crash, we would have no more networks, our infrastructure would fall apart uh, because most of our buildings are made of, of various types of plastic. Half of us would be naked. Um, you know, like the, the world would really kind of disintegrate in this, in this very uh, um, visceral way. Um, so I think that the question of, of how, we, how we want to deal with the kind of materiality of plastic and its longevity and its relationship to these new forms of organisms that wouldn't, wouldn't be existing were it not for the amount of plastic in the world, um, that, uh, that we have to be able to develop an ethics of care and compassion towards them. So as Donna Haraway says, natural or not, good or not, safe or not, the critters of technoculture make a body and soul changing claim on their creators that is rooted in the generational obligation of and capacity for responsive attentiveness. So what I'm arguing for is that the plastosphere, these, organs, these bacterial organisms are our queer kin. They are our queer progeny. They are our non-filial progeny. And these are the, are the 
organisms that we have to um, learn how to develop some kind of an ethical relationship to because whether we like it or not, we birth them. And, and I think we have a sense of obligation towards um, these kinds of unintended futures that are simultaneously killing out a lot of the megafauna uh, that we see around us while birthing these new kinds of strange bacterial communities. Um, so one of the artists that, uh, that, I, that I like to think with in relationship to these kinds of questions is Pinar Yoldish, um, who has uh, made these uh, beautiful... Um, these beautiful organs, sensory organs for the plastosphere. And the project basically asks the question, um, what would happen if life were to start um, from the oceans today? And I mean, this isn't entirely just a speculative question because clearly, you know, life is continuing to evolve in the oceans at all times. And therefore, um, it's, not, it's not just a matter of, of speculation, but is, but is actually a matter of biology, although these, these particular organs are, are uh, ones that she made up. Um, but, uh, but clearly, so the organs that would be necessary um, for the plastosphere are things like, you know, a sensory organ. Um, this is a kind of uh, kidney um, that can digest various types of plastic. She's made various kinds of stomachs so that, you know, uh, polyethylene can be digested in one stomach, whereas PVC can be digested in another stomach, and um, HDPE can be digested in another stomach, um, and has also created all kinds of other uh, things that go along with the ecosystem of excess, um, uh, such as um, these turtles that, that are uh, balloon turtles because, and there's the relationship between these things because of the fact that um, turtles, for whatever reason, really do like to eat balloons. Um, and uh, that's their preferred, preferred plastic intake. Um, and, so, and so because of this, she was imagining what would happen if they just continued to eat balloons and perhaps their, their shells could turn into these sort of balloon infrastructures that would then allow them to float around while eating their preferred um, form of plastic. Um, so I think, that, I think that these kinds of imaginative and speculative projects have a huge amount to offer in terms of being able to face what is otherwise a fairly bleak um, looking future, but do so in a way that is both that is playful and that carries this notion of obligation and care towards the future um, that I think is central to um, a feminist ethics. Um, so now that we are increasingly being impinged upon to acknowledge the porosity of our bodies, so although plastic has this has this complete um, ha is, a, is a material manifestation of the desire for containment, and like, and this is what it was designed for: is literally to become a barrier for the organism in the outside world, and um, and is is developed as such. Um, obviously, with with increased knowledge of the kinds of ways in which plastic is is infiltrate infil infiltrating and has already infiltrated all of the kind of mechanisms of the earth, from geology to hydrology to biology, um, we we obviously need to recognize the porosity of our own bodies. And this means that we need to find ways of living with toxicity. So returning back to the example of, of the, the phthalates and, the, and the, 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 the unexpected and unintended queering of our environments and of our biological systems, um, one, of the, one of the things that, that that does is we can think about it in generative um, and, and generative and productive ways. So um, Mel Chen writes a lot about this relationship to toxicity, um, and she writes about it in relationship to be being um, constructive. So toxicity provides the advantage of not positing the possibility of a radical spl split or a clean end. So one of the problems with our, with our particular kinds of imaginative systems is that something like, like the Anthropocene often gets figured in a way where um, we are going to reach the end of time or there's this moment where there, you know, something like an extinction event, we think of it as this sort of like moment at which... Um, you know, there's like this kind of clean, in a kind of Hollywood fashion, you know, the apocalypse comes and, and then that's, that's the end of it. Um, and I mean, in a certain way, wouldn't it be nice if that was what was ahead of us? Uh, because that seems at least um, like a kind of break that, that you know, you could, you could have a, a sort of relationship with. But, um, but clearly this is not what's gonna happen. Um, these kinds of events are much more along the lines of uh, slow death, of slow violence, of, um, of a kind of ongoing suffering 
suffering in a world that becomes increasingly toxic, um, but that... Um, but that is certainly not apocalyptic. So tox toxicity is about a kind of futurity that struggles to be hopeful without this reassurance of a clean break. Um, and instead, toxicity and the figure of queerness um, recognize and privilege mutation, sickness, and the permutation of the body by its outside. So one of the other things that she draws attention to is that toxicity is also related to processes of intoxication. So what does it mean to be intoxicated, and how can we potentially think about that as a figure of, of thought in relationship to these kinds of toxic events um, that we think about in relationship to the environment. So Chen writes, I suggest that queering is imminent to animate transgressions, violating proper intimacies, include, including between humans and non-human things. Um, and in the book, she has this um, really incredible sort of description of her own environmental illnesses and how um, when they get really bad, she can't tell the difference between the couch and her girlfriend, um, and she doesn't remember whether she had the conversation with the couch or with the girlfriend. And clearly that's an indication of a certain amount of suffering, but it also opens up particular ways of thinking about the world that are otherwise inaccessible. So thinking along the lines of the things that um, disability studies have ta has taught us is what are the ways in which toxicity uh, opens up these possibilities for being otherwise, even if that being otherwise is not necessarily good in nature, right? So extinction or non-reproductivity under this rubric cannot be neatly sealed off. Understood from this perspective, queerness allows for an ecological understanding that we are not impenetrable. Rather, we are composed of what surrounds us, so everything that is surrounding us is also what we are. Our bodies are, for are forces to reveal the ways in which, or sorry, our bodies are permeable, they cross over in ways that resist categorization. Toxicity forces us to reveal the ways in which we are multiply composed of plastic, of toxins, of queer morphologies. The fiction of independence and impenetrability is one that only a few bodies can bear, and clearly the bodies that bear the fiction of impenetrability and imperme impermeability are the ones um, with the most power in this world. Um, and for, the, for everybody else, uh, clearly, um, this is, this is obviously a fiction. For those who can afford it, this knowledge of the permeability of the body, and particularly to toxins, often results in an attempt to barricade bodies off from their surrounds. So instead of actually dealing with the fact of toxicity and trying to be able to figure out ways of living with toxicity, we just try to figure out ways of putting it somewhere else. And most of the time, the putting it somewhere else means putting it some in, in the place where somebody else lives and that somebody else uh, whether human or non-human, is somebody who has much less power than you do. Um, so barricading is precisely what underpins the logic of the emergence of plastics in the world to begin with, the fantasy that we conceal ourselves off from the outside world, providing a pure, clean surface that will preserve and protect. In seeking to re refashion the re molecular structure of, or, of organic and inorganic compounds, we believed so much in our own hubris that we seemed surprised to encounter negative consequences. But so many of us already know that this is a fantasy that can no longer be sustained. For the nihilistic, apocalyptic, or masculinist techno-fantasies of the future will only lead to the continued reproduction of the social order as we know it, and if not, the heightened social order of petrocapitalism and its continuation. To acknowledge that the future will be queer in the sense of completely disruptive and also in the sense of learning from queer, queer folks who have never assumed biological reproduction or even con continuance as a kind of possibility of hope that futurity has to be completely reconfigured. Um, means finding a way to live with toxicity, extinction, and, with, and without the reassurance of an open horizon of the future. Toxicity provides a resolution to the question of what to do with the ambivalence of queerness, only to the extent that it does not represent a choice. It is already here. It is not a matter of queer political agency so much as a queered political state of the present. Nevertheless, an uptake rather than a denial of toxicity seems to have the power to turn a lens on the anxieties that produce it and allow for a queer knowledge production that gives some means for structural rem remedy while not abandoning a claim to being just a little bit off. 
So the lessons of queer social structures, of families not based on biology, and lives not necessarily afforded protection from the state or other institutions of power, might be instructive in facing both our non-filial human progeny and a world filled with increasing uncertainty. Instead of biological children, our plasticized mi microbial progeny will offer a decidedly queer world. And I think I'll just end there. <laughs>